Hi there, my name is Trish Lynch. Welcome to IOHR TV. Today we are at the World Conference on Statelessness, which is in The Hague. IOHR are the official media sponsor. Today I'm joined by Radhika Kumaswamy. Radhika, great to have you with us. Thank you for joining us today. You're a keynote speaker at this year's conference on statelessness. Tell me why statelessness is such an important issue for you. Well, I think um, because it's an issue that has uh, come to my a sort of consciousness and emerged only recently, even though it has been with me since childhood. For example, in Sri Lanka, uh, when I was uh, young, I remember debates around the household about uh, the Indian Tamil population on the plantations in Sri Lanka and the whole issue of whether to give them citizenship or not give them citizenship, send them back to India, or, and it was something that was always there. Um, then, uh, of course, uh, the Rohingya issue, uh, the Sri Lankan Tamil issue also raised this issue. Uh, and the Rohingya, I was appointed to the fact-finding mission uh, on uh, Myanmar by the Human Rights Council. It's a team of three. Mm, and this, uh, this issue of statelessness is very, very important for that issue. And I was appointed in 2017. So, I've been doing a lot of uh, thinking uh, around this issue. The way in which sexual violence has been taking place in Myanmar is particularly brutal, and take it from a former special rapporteur on violence against women. The scale, brutality, and systematic nature of rape and violence indicate that they are part of a deliberate strategy to intimidate, terrorize, or punish the civilian population. They are used as a tactic of war. But it's an issue whose time has come because the main problem, I think, facing the world today is migration. And I think we have to all get together and think about uh, migration uh, in a very serious way and what kind of solutions we have. Now, statelessness is only one aspect of this mi migration because there are illegal uh, workers, undocumented workers, there are, um, shall we say, uh, human smuggling, trafficking, all this is what I call the subterranean world. And statelessness is one aspect of it. All these categories are fluid. And we need to come up with a solution. These people can't be in this limbo for the rest of their lives as they have in the past. Uh, and so I think the time has come to focus on the issue of statelessness. You also served as the UN Special Representative for Children and Armed Conflict up until July of 2012. Tell me about the future for children. Can you be optimistic? With regard to statelessness, it's a serious issue. Now in the United States, they're having major problems uh, because the Convention on the Rights of the Child is very particular uh, that uh, children should have a nationality, they have the, should have the right to acquire nationality, and sometimes what happens is if their mother does not have a nationality, or even if she does, if her husband is of another nationality, she can't pass it to her children. So there are major issues with regard to children that come up with the problem of uh, statelessness uh, that we have to, do, have to deal with. And you know, when, when you are under threat, what you do first is save your children. So even if you look at the Rohingya populations coming across, I was also uh, in, on the Kenyan-Somalian border, and I just would see all these groups of young children coming without any adult, just holding hands and crossing the border, because the parents are trying to save the household or deal with mm -hmm. issues, but they want to save the children, so they send the children. So unaccompanied children is one of the biggest humanitarian issues. Let's just put it this way, they are a very important part of the problem and we have to really think uh, outside the box on how to handle them. You're also a strong advocate for women's rights. You've intervened on behalf of many women and many children throughout the world who are seeking clarification from various governments in cases involving violence against women. We know that being stateless has a terrible impact on people, but being a woman and being stateless, it's obviously another level of danger. Tell me more about that. Well, the danger is that stateless women are much more likely to be trafficked. Uh, uh, in their desperation uh, to get status or to get out of a country, whatever, they can be offered, uh, 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 they, they can be exploited terribly. 
uh, maybe f as sex workers or even in uh, sexual, very exploitative work environments. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, if you marry uh, the whole nationality law, that in many parts of the world, strangely, when a man marries a woman, the woman automatically gets his nationality if she wishes it. Uh, but in most parts of the world, if a um, woman marries a man of another nationality, he cannot get her nationality. So if they live in the woman's country, he becomes uh, literally operating uh, without a nationality. So the big area for women besides trafficking is the nationality laws around the world. With such an important conference about statelessness and inclusion, listening to people's testimony, it's heartbreaking. And it makes you wonder how we're still in this position around the work. Tell me, what are the key factors in trying to get people recognised and ending statelessness once and for all? It's just to be aware that it is such a pervasive problem. Now today, seated next to me at lunch was a man who told me about the status problems about the Bedouins in Kuwait, which I was completely unaware of. Then, you know, the problem in Bhutan. All over the world, practically, there are the stateless issues. And I don't think most people have not even heard of the word stateless. Then we have to devise the pathway to citizenship uh, of statelessness uh, and be very clear about it. For me, status people, there are two things you want to do. One is that they should be, as they come into a country, be given fundamental rights, you know, especially for children, education and health. Uh, these are very crucial things. Uh, and, and then you move on to civic rights, whatever. So there must be a pathway to citizenship. And so people are very clear as to where they go. Uh, uh, and uh, so I think clarity of status is very key. Uh, and I think NGOs and others should push governments to define that clarity, you know, and to deal with it in a humane manner and not clarity that's exclusive, but an inclusive uh, clarity. You've also spent a large portion of your life advocating for human rights. You've held many important roles. Which one has meant the most to you and what achievements are you most proud of? Well, of course, the special representative on children in armed conflict, I, I had a whole department of the UN dedicated to that and took me to all the conflict areas uh, of the world. Uh, I deal with the issue of child soldiers and other things, the Security Council. And I think there was quite a lot of progress made uh, during that time. Uh, so that's where I witnessed these, these stateless children crossing borders without adults. Even the Rohingyas, waves of children came. That's the first sign that something's going wrong. You're a strong, independent woman. You have an amazing track record. You've done incredible good over your career. Do you have any words of wisdom that you can share with our online viewers, with our viewers at home? What words of wisdom would you have for them? First, I think they must understand, like these uh, boys in Thailand, that in your schools and your workplaces, everywhere, there are probably stateless people and you don't even know it. Who, who, who really need your help and comfort, uh, support. Uh, so first I think to just recognize the other within you so that they can be part of you. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I think uh, when I see sometimes children interacting, it's good in a way they don't know that at a young age, but at a, a later age, I think young people should recognize that there are people that are being excluded um, somehow I feel in these generations, as opposed to the earlier generations, um, that sense of uh, worrying about inequality and being excluded, it doesn't come as easier, easily as it did to generations before or just after World War II. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think so that's the first thing I think is needed, is to be aware of the people around you who are being excluded. Uh, it's because they're stateless or something else. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, of course, work toward their rights. It's the World Conference on Statelessness. It's a three-day event bringing together 290 people from all over the world, advocates, human rights defenders, people who have been affected by statelessness. On your wish list, what would you like to happen today and moving forward? Two things. One is, I think, to come up with some roadmap or whatever of, of what we are going to do around the world to lobby for this issue. Um, then I think also to think of amendments to the Convention on Statelessness uh, that's come. Uh, and also to give an encouragement to the PhD students and others who are thinking and writing on this. Uh, 
uh, to expand their horizons. And of course, most importantly, to have the activists who have come here uh, to be able to interact with uh, people uh, from other parts of the world, tell their stories and their cases, uh, and be able to move their agendas forward. Radhika Kumaswamy, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you. And we thank you for joining us online and at home for another edition of IOHR TV. Don't forget you can see many other episodes on our website. From myself, Trish Lynch, and the team, until next time, goodbye.